So what trick have you not done before that you want to do? Uh, switch backside flip. And by the way, I've never met you, right? You never met me? Never met you. Okay, great. So um, you've never been hypnotized? No. Just go with it. Don't resist it. And sleep. All the way down. Relax your body. Relax your body. Take another deep breath now. Each and every time I suggest the words deep sleep, you go back into the state ten times deeper. So eyes open and deep sleep. Eyes open, sleep. Eyes open, sleep. Now in a moment, you're going to find that anything you set your mind to, you can do. So even a skateboarding trick you've never tried, you'll be able to do very easily. You decided to breathe and now your body's breathing. And you're going to decide to do this trick and your trick will happen. So go ahead in a moment, open your eyes and go ahead and nail that trick. What trick are you going to do for us? Switch back, side flip. All right, let's do it. Never done this before. Welcome to the Fallen State. I am Jesse Lee Peterson. Don't forget to help us fight censorship by hitting the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring the bell, right? Ring my bell. You can ring my bell. I have with me Marcel Klein, and he is a successful coach and hypnotist. Marcel, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. First of all, I didn't know you were so young. I saw a video of you, but it didn't seem like you were this young. You're 20? Yeah. yeah, so I'm 21. 21. I'm 21, yeah. I'm, I'm probably one of the youngest people to do what I do. And how did you get into hypnotizing people? So hypnosis is one of the tools I use, but uh, I, w I went to my friend's school. He goes to San Diego State University. Well, he went there. And he invited me. He's like, hey, come over. And at the same night, they were having a hypnotist show or a hypnosis show that night. And they called my friend up. And at the time, he was not confident at all. Would not make eye contact with people. Wouldn't even shake your hand. They call him up on stage. All of a sudden, the hypnotist hypnotizes the group. My friend gets hypnotized, does ridiculous things. I'm like, there's no way my friend would be able to even <laughs> do that, fake that, because he's not confident enough to do it. And at the end, he says, I'm going to leave all of you off with an incredible sense of self-confidence and happiness. And he comes off stage is incredibly confident, goes up to one of the prettiest girls in the entire room, <laughs> tells me, hey, find a place to sleep. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he, really? ends up, he ends up sleeping with her that night, and then he dated her for like a few months. Wow. And up until this day, he's one of the most confident guys I've ever met. So I said, okay, I need to learn this. And I realized that it's the quickest way to change someone's mindset. So is he still hypnotized? He's not. So what people don't understand is that hypnosis is just the natural way we're programmed. So from age zero to eight, our brain is in what we call theta. So if you were to put a, a EEG scan or, or some biofeedback machine on your brain, you would see that your brain from age zero to eight is in what we call theta. Theta is hypnosis. So we're programmed from age zero to eight. That's why your childhood is so important. That's why, that's why they say that you can learn languages so quickly when you're young. And after that, it's very hard to change your habits. So the reason is because is your brain goes from theta to beta. All I do is put people back into theta. So if you were programmed in theta, why not be reprogrammed in that state? And so prior to that night or day of seeing your friend going through that, I didn't believe had in it. you considered doing it at didn't, all? I, I, didn't, I, I never even believed in hypnosis. I thought this is like BS. I thought everyone's a scam artist. I'm like, if they do it, they're playing along. There's no way this makes sense. And then even up until, even when I saw it, I didn't want to believe it because I was conditioned to believe that change happens over a long period of time. You can't just right. change quickly. It took me a long time to build my confidence and for someone to just snap his fingers up on stage within an hour and my friend becomes as confident as me, it, it didn't make sense to me. And how long ago was that? When did it happen? So that was when I was 18. When, so, uh, I just when this happened to your friend at, when you were 18? Yeah, so when I just turned 18. Really? And so today, is he still confident? Oh my God, he's extremely confident. Yeah. yeah. Like you would, you would never even know. <laughs> You'd really? be like, I've never seen someone this confident in my life. And so is it possible him to, for him to come out of that at some point? You see, I think once you're, it, it, it's just as hard as it was for him to become confident before that point, it would be just as hard for him to become less confident because he, unless he's hypnotized to not be confident, he's not going to not be confident. Well, can he fall out of that state? I don't think, I mean, I think at, at, some, at some level, there might be things that make him uncomfortable, but in general, overall, I don't think so. And so you decided that day, I'm going to do this. I said I have to learn it. There's no way, there's no way someone on stage can change these people's lives, and, and I'm not. Because up until that point, I was helping men specifically in dating. I was giving them dating advice, and I was oh, coaching you were. them. Yeah, you were so, a dating coach. Yeah, so I started off as a dating coach. Not anymore. Oh, okay. But when I, so when I, I started off at 16, because 
I, I kept getting my heart broken, and I, I'm like, okay, well, I, I need to figure out how, how people think, how women think. How can I prevent myself from getting my heart broken again? Because I kept doing the same things over and over and over again, and yeah. I got the same results. I'm like, I'm doing something wrong. And why is it these guys are able to date the most popular girls in high school, and, and I'm not? And I started to study it, and I started to change, and I'm like, okay, I have to be more, more confident. So I worked on my confidence, and after about seven or eight months of just being obsessed of how, how women think, how men think, the dynamic between men and women, I started to ask, like, I, people would ask me for advice, and every single time they'd ask me for advice, they would get the girl they wanted. And then I started charging them, because I had so many people asking me, I'm like, let's, <laughs> let's make some money here. Right. So I started charging them money, and then girls would come ask me for advice, and then girls would do really well. And then I started to see their perspective, and the way it evolved is, by the time I was 18, I still wanted to be a doctor. And, you know, I was kind of doing this for fun. It, I was just, it was more of like, I want to help people find love, you know, be able to connect with each other, bond with each other, right. and just be more socially acute. And then when I was 18, I saw this happen. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's learn hypnosis. This is cool. If I could snap my fingers and make men and women extremely confident, because that's one of the biggest issues for yeah. people. They can't approach people. They can't talk to people. Especially they, men. Yeah, especially men. Yeah. Especially men, yeah. They, I mean, they have so, social anxiety is huge. They're afraid of rejection. And I'm like, well, if I could just eradicate that fear instantaneously, how much time could, could they save? I mean, wh what if instead of waiting until they're 30 to get to this point, what if they could do it instantaneously? And then I became obsessed with figuring out hypnosis. I started studying it. And I just decided I'm going to be the best. So Amazing. I went out every single day. And I tried, at the beginning, I tried to hypnotize three, 400 people a day. And I failed every single time. It wouldn't, <laughs> it wouldn't work. I would just go on YouTube. And I'm watching these people hypnotize other people. And I'm like, what are they doing that I'm not doing? I could not figure it out. And then finally, I was at UCLA. My sister just graduated. So I have a twin sister. She's 21. She graduated from UCLA in three years. And at the time, she was still going there. So I'm like, OK, let's go to UCLA, because a lot of people walking around. And I walked around, and I tried on 10 people. And every single one just wouldn't go into hypnosis. And then finally, I said, you know what? I'm going to hypnotize somebody right now. There's no way. I've, <laughs> at this point, it's been at least 900, 800, 900 times I've, I've failed. I'm not failing anymore. Don't give up. Yeah, and I, I became way more confident that time and way more certain. And when I went up to this girl, I looked at her, and I, I just said, I'm going to hypnotize you. And she's like, whoa, OK. And I hypnotized her, and I said, you're going to forget your name. And I said it with extreme certainty. I have it on video. And then I'm like, what's your name? And she's like, I know my last name. <laughs> but she couldn't remember her first name. And I'm like, no way. I just, I just hypnotized somebody. And then finally, I realized that it has to do with, with my frame. Like, how, how confident can I be when I do it? Because I was very uncertain. I've never done it. So it was, it was difficult for me to actually get someone to believe that I could do it. Because right. they'd be like, oh, you couldn't hypnotize me. And you could see that it would affect me. I would be like, oh, maybe I can't. And now, I mean, there's no one I can't hypnotize. I can hypnotize anyone, anywhere, anytime. And Amazing. I, I, yeah. And so did you bring her out of it? Oh, yeah, yeah of course, yeah. And oh. then, she, you know, I made her feel really good. I made her really confident. And then that's when I'm like, okay, finally, I'm, I'm on to something. And then as I would progress, I, I would learn, for example, from other people. Because I, I went to a school called Hypnosis Motivation Institute. So it's the only accredited college of hypnotherapy in the entire United States. And they would teach you that it takes eight sessions sometimes to get people into weight loss, you know, to, to start to, to want to lose weight, to quit smoking. It doesn't happen quickly. And I didn't like that idea because I saw my friend change his life instantaneously. And I'm like, there's no way that it takes eight sessions to change somebody's life. Right. So I started to short, take shortcuts. I'm like, okay, how can I just quickly change somebody's life? Like, can I do it in, in a few seconds? And what I found now is that a seminar, I'll call someone up, let's say that has a stutter. This past weekend, I was in Chicago. And I was literally walking around, being like, you have confidence. Your stutter is gone. This guy who's been stuttering since he was three years old stands up, starts speaking completely clearly, no stutter, no hesitation. And we just followed up with him. It's been a few days, and he's still no stutter. This guy, Tourette's, got rid of it. This other guy, I mean, it was, it was very emotional. But, but what I found is that you could change people's lives instantaneously. And then I asked myself, I'm like, why is it I can bring someone to change instantaneously? And I started thinking about all the times in my life I've changed. And I realized that change doesn't happen over time. It might take a lot of time to get to the moment where you decide to change your life or change your mindset. But change happens in a moment. You decide to change in an instant. So I just shorten the time that it takes for you to get there. And then I help people transform their lives. Amazing. So when you, at 18, when you saw this happen, did you go to, go to school somewhere at that time? Or you so just I was going to college. Online? Yeah, so I was going to college. Uh, 
at Pierce College, it's a community college, oh, yeah. and I was studying neuroscience, but I wanted to be a doctor. My goal was to be a plastic surgeon. Did you become a doctor? I did not become a doctor. Oh, you gave it up. <laughs> yeah, I gave it up. So I dropped out of college after two years. Amazing. Because I decided... Good deal, man. Yeah, I decided I, I, I want to do this full time. I'm like, well, I want to change lives, and I don't want to wait till I'm 32 to do it. Yeah. So, did you hypnotize yourself? So, I, yeah, I do it all the time. You pretty, hypnotize yourself all the time? All the time. And how do you do that? So pretty much everything you, f you do is based off of an emotion. So when you feel really happy, you think about all the things in your life that make you happy. When you feel sad, you think about the things that make you sad. But why does your brain look for reasons to make you happy or sad? Well, the reason you feel any emotion is because an emotion is a strategy to achieve an outcome. So I'm happy because I think being happy will help me get something. I'm sad or depressed because I think being sad or depressed will help me get something. For example, a lot of the time people will be depressed because they want attention or love. When do yeah. they get depressed? They get depressed when someone breaks up with them, when someone passes away. And now they're not getting that love anymore, so then they'll get depressed in hopes that people will come give them attention and nurture them right. and care about them. Yeah. And then one of two things can happen. They don't get rewarded, so then that emotion gets stronger, hoping that the more they feel it, the more likely they are to get more attention, or they'll change. One of two things happens. So either you're rewarded or you change. And what I realize is that whenever I want to change what I'm doing, I just have to change how I feel. Because if I change how I feel, I see things differently. If I'm, in, if I'm stressed out, if I'm anxious, if I'm feeling sad, and I want, to, I want to be motivated and I want to go do things, I need to change how I feel first. So self-hypnosis isn't necessarily about changing your habits. It's more about changing the emotions that you're feeling. And if you can control your emotions, I call this emotional intelligence, being aware of the emotions you feel and why you feel them. So let's say you wake up in the morning. Yeah and you're feeling sad mm -hmm. or depressed, you don't want to go to work, you've thought about something and you just don't feel like it. Yeah. How would you hypnotize yourself to feel better to get up to go to work? What would you do? Got it, so a few things. If I don't like my job, I'm not yeah. gonna do it. Right. That's for sure. So if you really don't like your job, you should quit and do something you like. So instead of hypnotizing yourself to go to work and do something you don't like, you should hypnotize yourself into having the confidence to go after what you really love. But let's say you do love what you're doing and you still woke up and you're right. not in the mood. Then, then you'd have to ask yourself why you're not motivated. Usually people aren't motivated because they don't think they're getting a reward. Like they're not making progress it, it, towards their goal. They have a specific idea or like a blueprint of what they want. And if they're not getting it, then they stop feeling motivation. They start to feel sad. Because motivation comes hand in hand with with happiness, and if you're not necessarily happy, it, it comes with a, some kind of feeling of fulfillment, a positive emotion. Even if you're motivated from pain, because we're motivated from one of two emotions, pain or pleasure. You're either motivated to get away from the pain or you're motivated to go towards something that makes you feel good. Right. So if the thing doesn't make you feel good, then you're not necessarily gonna go towards it, but it doesn't make you feel good because you don't believe that it will. So a lot of people won't go pursue the career that they want. They won't get motivated to go to the gym every morning because there's a part of them that doesn't believe that it'll make them feel good. They associate more pain to their goals than they do pleasure. Well, what happens if you wake up, you love your job, you yeah. have an amazing job, okay. right? but you like your job, but then something else has caused you to become depressed mm -hmm. or sad, and you wake up feeling that way this morning. Do you convince yourself, well, the job gonna make me feel better? How do you get out of that? Got it, so, how do you, so, so the reason we're depressed is because we're not present. We're not in what's, we're not in the moment. We're thinking about what happened to us in the past, even if it's an hour before, it's still the past. Right. So, you know, let's say you went through something. I actually had a client who, you know, CEO, really big CEO, has, has 500 employees that they have to manage. And, you know, he's older, he's like 40, but his father passed away and he's like, I can't, I can't go to work. And it's, it's, it's a big week, like that. he has to go to work. And he's like, I can't go to work. So similarly to what you're saying, he was feeling depressed and he wasn't motivated. And what we did is, is I had to help him reframe, reframe what was going on. So he framed it in his mind, and a frame is kind of the lens you're looking at it through. So the way he was looking at it was that his life now sucks, he has no reason to live, and he kind of lost himself. So if someone's at home and let's say feels depressed for whatever reason, it could be something like you lost a family member or you're just not motivated to go to work, you have to ask yourself, why, why do you want to do it? Why was he a CEO in the first place? And instead of focusing on what's not motivating you, because it's, it's what you focus on. If you're focusing on things that don't motivate you, you're not going to be motivated. If you're focusing on things that will, you will be. So if I, if I think about how long my work's going to be, how I hate sitting in my office, how I can't stand my coworkers, how it's stressful, I'm not going to want to go to work. Right. But if I think about all the change I'm going to make for other people, the lives I'm going to impact, how fun it is, how much money I'm going to make, I'm going to be more motivated. So it's... it's becoming aware of what you're focusing on and then shifting it. Oh, I see. So let's say that I, I love my job, okay. but I'm depressed about something else. Okay. If I start thinking, wow, I love my job, 
I'm going to go and do this job and I'm going to be off at five and I'll be free. Mm-hmm. Is, that a motor, is that a form of overcoming? I mean, hypnotizing yourself? Yeah. So because all, you're thinking about what's going to happen at the end of the day? So all hypnosis is, is going from one belief to another. If I believe oh. I'm going to have an awful day, yeah. I'll have an awful day. If I believe I'm going to have an amazing day, I'm going to have an amazing day. Even Abraham Lincoln uh, once said, people's happiness uh, d- depends on, their, on, right. on how happy they think they're going to be. I was uh, in preparing for this interview. For some reason, I thought uh, about it yesterday. I was thinking, wow, most, all, most people are hypnotized. They're already in a hypnotic oh, 100%. state. They're in a hypnotic state, but they don't know it. Always. Because I used to be in that hypnotic state, mm-hmm. but I didn't know I was hypnotized. Yep. And it was only when I came out of it that I knew I was hypnotized. Mm-hmm. And so, and what allowed me to see that I was hypnotized is that I don't live in the future. I just live right now. And in that, I am not hypnotized. But if I thought about the past or the future, I would become unconscious. Yeah, no, 100%. So we're on autopilot most of the day, 95% of the time. Yeah. But actually what's happening right now with, with the culture is that they're hypnotizing people to be losers. Yeah, they're, absolutely. Literally, I mean, yeah. and I could tell you right now that the media, our culture, politicians, they're brainwashing, they're hypnotizing people yeah. to hate each other, to be divided, to not believe that they can succeed, to believe that they need the government to incite a bunch of fear. And that's why suicide rates are at an all-time high, depression rates are at an all-time high, yeah. drug overdose rates are at an all-time high. And there are studies that show that 90% of antidepressants have no significant impact yeah. over, over yeah, a placebo. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that they're even prescribing this medication, it's, it's profit. That's the biggest problem. I'm not going to say, I can't legally tell anyone to stop doing drugs. And right. you shouldn't. Yeah. But what I can say is that the drugs that are being prescribed, like if, if you look at what it takes to be determined, like for someone to say, you're, let's say I'm a psychiatrist, you're my, you're my patient. For me to say that you're clinically depressed, it's, it's very easy, very easy for me to say that you are. Yeah. You don't sleep well that often. You don't always do the things you used to do. It's, it's a, a very simple checklist that everybody might, from week to week, depending on how bad your week was, might go through. And if that week, for example, you had a bad week, you see a psychiatrist, you're not clinically depressed, and I prescribe medication <laughs> to you. And then what? Yeah. <laughs> for what? So are they able to do it because if you go into a psychiatrist's office and you trust that person, mm-hmm. are they able to hypnotize you because you trust them? So, so you're going to believe what they say? Yes. So everything you believe becomes a reality. Absolutely. All a hypnotist does is makes Absolutely. you believe a different yeah. reality. Yeah. Now, as a psychiatrist, you believe that I'm an expert. Yeah. And because you believe I know what I'm talking about, if I tell you you're depressed and you believe me, you then become depressed. That's deep. That is so true. It's awful. That is so true. It's, and they don't even know that. I used to think that people with, with degrees, like doctor's degree, lawyer degree, a master's degree, yep. uh, means STD. Nothing. means nothing. It means nothing. It really don't. It's just that we think that it does. Mm-hmm. And so when these people get these degrees, we believe what they say, and we, we have turn all of our lives to they're, they're so, it's, it's this, the biggest delusion I've ever, when I got into this field, I realized that psychology, what they're learning, psychologists, yeah. Yeah. psychiatrists, they know nothing. You're it's absolutely very, right. It, it's, it's controversial for me to say this, but what they're... You're you so right now. How can so someone, amazing. How can someone sit down in front of a psychologist <laughs> for seven years and not get changed? That's right. How can someone go there and be depressed their entire life? Are you telling me that a chemical imbalance, in other words, a lack of ability to focus on the right things, is a disease for the rest of your life? That's right, man. It, and, That's amazing. Oh, yeah. No. Isn't that like amazing? Oh, it, it's incredible. Yeah. I, people come to me that have gone to psychiatrists and psychologists for years, yeah. and in five minutes, in five minutes, they change their life, and they don't go back to depression. They get off their medication. Yeah. I don't tell them to get off their medication. They just see it, because once they're not hypnotized anymore, they're out of it. They're out of it. Another thing, now that I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about other things that are happening in society, and I talk about this a lot on my radio show, is that, you know how when little kids are first born, they have a lot of energy and they run yep. around the place, they are interested in everything, they're, yep. they're learning. Mm-hmm. And nowadays when they go to school, if the teacher doesn't want to be, can't handle all that energy, they tell the parent, oh, your kid is uh, HTD. ADD, ADHD, yeah. yeah. Give him some medication, right? Oh, my God. And the parent would go and do it. I'm like, what the? <laughs> So this is, this is the biggest thing. We have to realize. And that like, you have to be hypnotized to do that. The, the pharmaceutical industry has so much impact on politicians and curriculum 
that they literally will teach. They, doctors don't know any difference. Psychiatrists don't know the difference. Psychologists don't know the difference. They're just learning the curriculum that's being funded by Big Pharma. Absolutely, man. In, in the 1970s. You are so, that's amazing. In the 1970s, some of the, I forgot his name. But Where do you come from? I'm, no. from, I'm born and raised in LA, but the biggest thing I've always been, I'm, I've always been a leader. I'm not a follower. I always, if, if someone says something to me, I fact check it. Right I don't on. believe it right away. Yeah. And I look around and all these people just believe everything everyone says. Oh, you should do, you should, you should, I've never done drugs in my life. I don't drink alcohol. You smoke pot? No, never. You never had pot? Nope, Here, never. Let me, let me see. I may have <laughs> no. no, I smoked it already. Yeah, no, no I, I'm I, I just, I, I'm, I believe that anything you can accomplish with, with drugs, you can do without drugs. Because yeah. by definition, you, so what a drug does is it replaces a neurotransmitter for the most part, right? Especially antidepressants, they replace a neurotransmitter. You have neuroreceptors, which means that they receive a signal or a chemical from your brain and then they process it. You have a transmitter that goes to a receptor and then the receptor processes it. If I have 100 receptors, it by definition means I have 100 transmitters. What I do when I take medication is I then replace my transmitters, become dependent on the drug, and then all of a sudden am now attaching to the, the parts of my brain that were already there. The only reason drugs work is because you have the drug in your brain. Otherwise, they wouldn't work. The, it, it, you already have the biology in your brain that makes the drug work. But when you do it externally, it stops producing it internally, and now you have to rely on it from another source. Wow. Um, I, um, I don't know if you're going to agree with this or not. Sure. When I was growing up, there was no such word as racism. And so, and I grew up on a plantation in Alabama under the Jim Crow laws and all that crap, right? Mm -hmm. But black people and white people didn't hate one another. Mm. And so, even though I agree with a, this 100%. there was a Jim Crow law there, but it wasn't making people hate each other. They knew that it was some government thing that they had done, but it didn't mean that all white people were for it. And then, uh, long come to came to come to word uh, racism. Uh, So-called black leaders and others started telling black people, white people are racist, right? Yep. And I noticed that that word hypnotized black people 70 years ago. Yep. And today it's even worse than ever. It's like they never came out of that uh, hypnotized yeah, so, situation. So it's, and so they believe something that exists that really doesn't exist. And look at what's happening, right? Look at what's happening. Yeah. Statistically, 12% of the population, which is African Americans, commit more than 50% of the violent crime. Yeah. Not because they're wrong or it's genetic that they're violent, because the culture that they're in is hypnotizing them to believe that. Absolutely, and, man. And I think that leadership Barack Obama was supposed to be the leader that united everybody. The fallen Messiah. He did the opposite. Yeah. He did the opposite. He I think made it I, worse. Honor, I think I I don't I know they don't get political, but I'll say it. I think he was the worst president ever. Absolutely. Ever. I mean, the national the economy was awful. Our, the culture, more than anything, is what he messed up. Yes. He messed up the culture in a way that it, it, look at this. We have we have a president right now, and whether people like him or not, I really the don't care. The great white hope. Yeah. But, I call him the great white hope. Look, look at what you know that? I didn't know that. Oh yeah. I love him. The I love great him. white hope. I he's going to win again, by the oh, way, yeah. because there, there aren't that many people in America that are stupid. Yeah, but right. there's, a, there's a large majority that's being hypnotized by the left. The left yeah. is controlling the media to make you think that he's misogynistic, to make you think he's racist. To, and there's nothing he said or done that Barack Obama didn't say or do. <laughs> there's not, and, and everything they're blaming him for, they've done. Yeah. Absolutely. Every, oh, Russian but collusion, Ukraine. Some people can't they did see it. that, though, because they're hypnotized. They're hypnotized. Yeah, and and this, is why, this is why they can't see it. I'll tell you why. We have a part of our brain called the reticular activating system, RAS. It tells you what to pay attention to. If you believe that Trump's a racist pig, if you believe he's, he's only looking out uh, to spew venom, if he's misogynistic, anything he says or does that's the opposite of that, your brain will delete, as if it never happened. Yeah. It'll ignore it. I could tell you right yeah, now, so true. it'll go in one ear out the other, because your brain's wired that way. Because yeah. they're in a trance to hate him. And what the media is doing is they're not letting you think for yourself. They're creating all this fear. The first thing you see on the news, when you watch the news, do you ever feel good? No. No, no they don't want you to feel good. You. They don't want you to feel good, because guess what I they're going to do? I don't believe them now. I don't watch them at all. It's yeah. fake. But it's all fake. There's yeah. nothing they say that's accurate. It's just, it's, it's all publicity. It's a business now. Yeah. But what they do is they'll incite a bunch of fear. They'll say something scary. North Korea, we're going to go to war, this, that. The other thing, scare you. Then they'll, because you're scared now, when you're scared, you're more suggestible. Your brain wants relief from fear, so it looks for guidance from some leadership or some authority that yeah. you trust to help you out of it. Because back in the day when we were in a tribe, if we were in a fight or flight situation, we would look to the leader of the tribe to help us get out of it. So it's, when you're in fight or flight, you're looking for a way to change your beliefs. Something you're doing is threatening your life, so now your brain has to look for a way to get out of it. So they put you in a fight or flight, they put you in fear, stress, anxiety, they put you in that state, 
and then they bombard you with all this negative opinion of, of our leadership, of our culture. They show you how police officers are just killing black people yeah. on the street, right? <laughs> and then what, what this causes is this causes mass shootings because then people start to hate other people and they start to literally divide yeah. and it, it creates madness. It also causes uh, people like Black Lives Matter, which don't actually care about black lives. Right. Uh, and you're black, you know this. At the ace of space. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I tell people all the time, be careful what you believe. Yeah. Because if you believe a lie, you're going to be controlled by that lie. Mm -hmm. And the people will cause you to believe it. So you really have to be careful what you well, believe. Well, people can't see through it. That's the thing. So yeah. someone watching this might even be like, oh, these guys are, are full of it. But the truth is, they are. Yeah. Because they're literally, you're literally, I mean, if you want control over your life, you have to realize that half a... 99% of everything everyone says to you is a lie. It's yeah, a lie. That's right, man. And, and unless you could see it from your own eyes, yeah. right, and realize what thoughts were programmed into you versus what are your own, you're going to continue to run off of other people's programming. I can look at somebody and I could tell you, I could tell you right away, I could tell you if this person's in trance or not. I literally will walk on the street. I see people in this derp state, this trance state, and I'll, I'll put them in trance and then take their phone and see if I can get away with it. Make them forget about it. They walk away because they're still in trance. And Amazing. then I walk up to them. I have a video of this on my Instagram. So, <laughs> I walk up to a random guy, just hypnotize him and take his phone, make him forget about it, goes to the store and I'm like, oh, here's your phone, you dropped it. And I'm like, oh, you forgot that happened. Hey, can I show you something? I show him the video and he's just, what the hell? He was angry that someone could just do that to him. Yeah. But I promise you, he wasn't in, in, in a trance state for long after. <laughs> so if you walked up to him, didn't know him, but you could see he's already in a trance, right? Yeah, you could hijack the trance. And what would you say to him? So it's not necessarily what I say. So what I did there, is, I'll break it down for you. I immediately start the conversation off with, hey, can I ask you one more question? Not because I talked to him before, but because it makes his brain, he's already on autopilot. Oh, so, yeah. so the autopilot response to, can I ask you one more question, will probably say, yeah, sure. Right. So, and then his conscious mind will kick in, wait, have I talked to this person before? It'll look for the evidence, have we ever had a conversation? And because we've never had one, it starts to create confusion. And then I'll take <laughs> his hand, which is a natural thing, it's, it's just unconscious. So I'll go to shake his hand and then, I'll interrupt that. So it's a natural process. And then I'll take his hand, I'll be like, look at your hand, and I just say sleep. And I just put him in. And his brain is so confused at this point, it just accepts my suggestion. <laughs> like, what the? Yep. <laughs> he, was, he had no idea what was going on. And then, and then afterwards, I, I'm like, okay, you know, you're stuck to the ground. And if he was stuck, it shows me that his brain is accepting my suggestions. If he wasn't, it would have been like, okay, it's, it's not working. I have to try a different approach. But he, he was stuck, and I'm like, okay, sleep, give me your phone. He kind of came out of it, and I'm like, you forgot that happened. You forgot that happened. Give me your phone. He gave me his phone. I'm like, cool, when you open your eyes, you're going to walk back into that store as if nothing happened. He wasn't walking to that store. I just made him walk into that store. And then I walk into the store, and I'm like, hey, here's your phone. You dropped it. He's like, oh, thanks, man. And I'm like, you forgot about that. You forgot it happened again as if we never met. And then I'm like, can I show you something, bro? And he's like, uh, yeah, sure, I guess. I'm like, who are you? And then I show it to him, and he's like, what? <laughs> what the? Hey, can I ask you one more question? What was your name again? Hey, can you look at your hand for me? And just sleep all the way down, all the way down. Just completely relaxing. And the moment you find it completely stuck to the ground, the more you try and move, the harder it becomes, you're completely stuck to where you are. Eyes open, wide awake. Can you move? What's going on? You can't move? Oh. Um, yeah, now in a moment, sleep all the way down. In a moment you open your eyes, you're gonna find you, you wanna just give me your wallet and your keys. Sleep all the way down. You're gonna find you just forget about that. You're just gonna wanna hand me your wallet and your keys now. Awesome. Thank you. And you're just going to forget that happened. You're going to walk into that store as if nothing happened. Come here. Come here. Come here. All right. Hey, man, I think you forgot your uh, phone. You, you dropped it? Oh, thank yeah. You. No worries. What was your name again? Dominique. Dominique. Nice to meet you, man. Uh, Marcel, uh, when I sat my fingers, you're completely wide awake. You forgot this happened, but you're completely wide awake. So let me ask, you said that. But people like this, imagine what the media does to people like that. I know, yeah. No, it's crazy. <laughs> I see it happening. You said that you used to, you've been through heartbreaks, right? Oh, yeah. Broken hearts. Yeah. And what does a broken heart feel like? So, well, I'll tell you the biological you? reason, and I'll tell you what I feel. Okay. So biologically, when you fall, fall in love with someone or you really like somebody, there's a lot of positive chemicals that are being released in your brain. Right. And then when you don't get them, it creates a withdrawal because now you're not getting that reward. Right. But a lot of people will fall for people. I was hypnotized, by the way, by the culture to believe that there's a specific way to approach women. And there's a specific way to, the, the dynamic was a certain way. Pretty much, I lower all my value. I have no, I have no value. I, I don't stand by my boundaries. Anything they do is okay. Yeah. And that was what I was, I was programmed to believe. You were taught that. I was taught that. That's what I was taught. 
You know, uh, my dad didn't really, my dad, my parents were together, but my dad knew better, but I would never listen to him because I trusted the culture, I trusted Disney, I trusted my mom, you know, and that's what they told me. And, and I would keep complimenting these women. I would want to buy them flowers. I had no money at the time. And I would, I would, you know, not eat so I could maybe have them eat something with me. <laughs> and then they would go sleep with another guy or, or just stop talking to me. And yeah. I'm like, what's going on? You know, what am I doing wrong? And then I started to study biology. I have a pet monkey. And I started to study anthropology, and I saw that we're primates. I'm like, well, we have instincts. Why are they instinctively not attracted to me? And what I realized is because I had no value. I wasn't, I wasn't valuing myself. Yeah, I, was, I was just giving them everything. That's a good point. Yeah, and then I'm like, okay, well, if I start to become more confident and have more boundaries and be like, listen, this is what I'm going to accept. This is what I'm not going to accept. All of a sudden, I got way more attractive, and, and all these women were you know, literally coming to me. Like, there was just, I, I would have to, I would be picky. I'm like, I don't even, before I, anyone that would come my way, I'd be happy that someone even <laughs> likes me. And now I'm, I'm debating who I want to date. And then I'm like, well, what makes women really attractive? And the thing is, women are taught not to respect or appreciate men. Yeah. That's what they're taught. Yeah. And then what happens is, is then they're unhappy later on. Well, if you want a guy to fall in love with you, the secret is to appreciate him. Yeah. Because if, if you make a guy feel like he's a man, by telling him how amazing he is, by complimenting him, by you know, which by the way is the complete opposite of what women are taught. I have women clients that come to me and they're like, I don't know why he doesn't like me. It's like, well, how many times have you complimented him? None. How many times have you flaked on him? Five. And what do you <laughs> what do you expect is going to happen? So let me ask. You know? um, so like when you uh, were heartbroken and you were uh, hypnotized, were you hypnotized before you met the girl? And then once you meet her, you would go into that mold and deal with it in yeah. a weak way, in a wimpy way? So I was hypnotized to believe that I need to fall to in love with a girl. To act a certain way. Yeah, and, uh, to act a certain way and to fall in love oh, with I a girl. And then any time a girl would even give me a little bit of attention, it would trigger that state. And yeah. all of a sudden, I would just, I, I would fall in love with them in two seconds. Yeah. It literally, oh my God, she, she sat on my lap. She gave me a hug. She said she likes me. She said I'm, I'm handsome. Boom, I would just fall for them. Amazing. Right? And then as I came out of that, I'm like, what, what is this? This isn't even, that's not even me. Yeah. Those things don't, uh, those that's not why. Why would I give someone all of me for just a compliment or giving me a hug? Right? It just didn't make sense. Amazing. I got to ask you this because of time. In one of your videos, you said you met someone at a Starbucks and you, uh, and this person paid you $100 to coach them, right? No, they paid me $5,000. So it depends. I, I've had multiple clients that have gone okay. to Starbucks. So they paid the first you time you're talking about was $5,000. The first time I ever met someone in person at Starbucks, I turned him into a client, and that was $5,000. And so he paid you $5,000 to? Yeah, I was a doctor. To teach him? Yep, to help him. He was a doctor. And so does he, is he a uh, hypnotist now? No, no, he, no, he wanted me to help him with his life. Oh, I'm, I see. Uh, yeah, so, I, I'm pretty, so this is my, my job. I'm a success coach. So I help people overcome any limiting beliefs that have been programmed into them, hypnotized into them, in their wealth, health, and relationships. The reason people don't have money isn't because they can't make money. It's because they don't believe they can. Right? There was a time in my life where I was homeless. My family was homeless. Really? Right? Yeah. We grew up super rich. 2008 economy crashed. We lost everything. And there was a time where we were literally homeless. And my parents went into a different, they literally went into a different state. They went from this abundance where they can produce money just by making deals to this scarcity. And all of a sudden they didn't have any money. And it just perpetuated constant no money, constant oh, stress. Yeah, yeah. And then I started to adopt that behavior. And then when I broke out of it, my parents broke out of it. So when I became really motivated and started making money, my parents became motivated, and now they're making a bunch of money again. Right so on. it was interesting because it took them out of that state. But a lot of people have this scarcity mindset in relationships, in, in their wealth, you know, it, even in health. So this, in this, were you surprised that this doctor were, didn't have confidence and that he would pay you $5,000 to coach him? Yeah, so at this time, pretty much I had two dogs that that night, th this is when I got this client, I made forty thousand dollars overnight. He was one. Of, he was part of it. Um, I had pretty much. He, he had paid me for for five sessions. It was a thousand dollars a session. But but I had two dogs, and I go to have dinner with my friend, and my dad calls me, and he tells me both your dogs are dead. And I said, What do you mean? He said they both got run over. Both your dogs are dead. And I come home, <laughs> and I hear my mom crying through the front door. My parents are obviously upset. They're struggling financially at the time. I wanted to help them, but I wasn't helping them financially yet. I had no idea how. I right. was hypnotized to believe it takes years to be successful. I need a college degree. I need to be older. I need to be wiser. I need to be more experienced. That's what was programmed into my brain. And I'm looking at my dogs. I'm hearing my mom cry because the front door was open, but the screen door was closed. And I'm looking at my dogs that were my dogs. I would wake up with them. They would sleep with me. I'd feed them. I'd walk them. And an hour and a half earlier, they're alive. And and now they're dead. And I'm listening to my mom and just her crying in the background. And I'm crying and I'm like, what, what can I do to help my parents? 
I need to do something. I can't bring my dogs back. What can I do? Right. And I said, I need to make more money. And all these limiting beliefs popped up. You don't have enough time. You know, yeah. you, you, you're, you're not old enough. You're not experienced enough. All my mentors in this field said that it takes years to build up my business. And I said, you know what? Forget this. I went into my house. I put on the only suit I, ha I owned. I, it was like short on me at the time. And I left my house. And I, I went into every restaurant, every place I could go into. And I just, I would, I would be like, hey, can I, make an, can I get everyone's attention, please? If anyone wants to be very confident, overcome any limiting beliefs, come talk to me. I'm going to be here for five minutes, and then I'm leaving. And the first three, four, five hours, nobody, nobody would come talk to me. <laughs> and then I was about to give up, and I walked into uh, Panera Bread. And in the back, there was a bunch of actors and, and screenwriters. And I asked some guys, I'm like, what are you guys doing here? He's like, oh, I'm an actor. I'm a screenwriter. And I was just so determined. I'm like, I, I, there's no way I'm not going to leave here without making $40,000. Because I was thinking about a podcast or an interview I heard with uh, Tony Robbins from oh, when yeah. he was young. And he said yeah. he would charge people $1,000 uh, for a half an hour session to get rid of any fear or phobia. And he had a six-month waiting list. I'm like, if he could do it, I can do it. Right. And he started young, too. I'm like, there's no way. I, if he could do it, I can do it. How old were you at this time? When you I were was 19. Oh, OK. So I was 19 here. And then I, I go to this Panera Bread. I'm in the back. There's like 40 people. And I make an announcement. I'm like, listen, you know, if any of you guys want to be the best actors, you want to be celebrities. And I just, I just got in state. I, I, like, I, I hypnotized myself to get into this peak. Like all of a sudden, I became an amazing speaker, very confident. Out of nowhere, I just said I had to do it because it was not working. I was about to give up. And I'm like, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to do it right now. And I had like 12 people right there sign up. For 12, like, like 12 people paid me $1,000 for a session. Some of them bought two sessions, and out of Amazing. nowhere. And that was it. I'm like, OK, boom, I'm, I'm on it. I'm not going to give up. And I just kept going until I, it was, I left my house at 8 PM on Saturday. I came back not on Sunday, but the following morning on Monday, 5 AM. I was exhausted, but I had forty thousand dollars. I made forty thousand dollars. That's amazing. Yeah, and that was it. And then I realized money's easy to make. Up until then, I would charge people one hundred fifty dollars a session and have a hard time asking them for money because I was programmed to believe that I didn't deserve money, money shouldn't come my way. And after that, money is just easy. So how much do you charge per session now? Uh, one on one, I charge ten k. You charge a person ten thousand dollars. But I'll tell you why I charge them ten thousand dollars. Why? Because if somebody comes to me. They're not confident. They don't believe they'll make money. Or let's say they already have money, but they don't believe they can have a relationship. They're, not, they're, they're smoking. They're addicted to something. In less than an hour, I reprogram their brain to eradicate everything they've been programmed to, all the limiting beliefs they've had their entire life, everything, any fear, any anxiety they have that's been programmed to them their entire life, which will take them a decade to get over on their own. In an hour, I get rid of it, and I replace it with an incredible sense of self-confidence uh, I mean, the ability to literally go after anything you want. And these people's lives change at a level that you've never seen before. Tony Robbins charges people a million dollars a year to see them for an hour a month and then gets equity in their company. I'm better than Tony Robbins. I'm going to be bigger than Tony Robbins, and yet I charge 10K. So to me, it's not that I'm charging you 10K. It's what do you get for 10K? If you can go to the supermarket and on the shelf was the mindset of your dreams, the mindset that you would have worked your butt off for, like everything you've ever wanted to think about, the way you wanted to feel, if that was on the market, how much would you pay for it? I give it to people for 10K. No one on the planet can give it to somebody. <laughs> so what, you do, what do you do if people want your help, but they don't have $10,000? So I have seminars. I also have groups that oh, I work I with, right? So for example, I have groups. If I can't work with someone one-on-one, -on -one, I love helping people. So my, my passion is to change lives. Right. It's not just about, hey, pay me money. I'm not just in it for the money. Right. But if someone wants my time one-on-one, -on -one, I charge them 10K. Right. But you know, I, work, I have seminars all over the country. I work with people. I, work with people. I have free seminars. You know? like I'll literally walk around and speak just because I love changing lives. That's, that's the way I got on the show. I, I got called up to speak on stage for free. I was there for free. I, you know, I love helping people. Right. That's why I do this. But if people can't afford it, you know, I, have, I have things that, that I have free content on my Instagram, free content on my, on my YouTube. If they want to come see me speak, a lot of time I speak for free. You know, I have free seminars in LA every two months. So how can a person tell when they're going the wrong way or they, they want the wrong things or whatever? So there's what you know you want and there's what you think you should want. What you think you should want is what when people tell you, hey, do drugs, but there's a bad feeling. People tell you, hey, you got to go to college. You got to work a nine to five. You got to build your way up the ladder. You might be excited about it, but there could be a feeling that says, well, if I could be a famous singer, if I could be a famous actor, if I could start my own business, I would. But then these limiting beliefs stop you from even seeing that as a possibility. Amazing. So, how would you define yeah. uh, success? Success? You said that. You know, you could be successful. Yeah. What is success? How would a person know if they're successful or not? So, so success to me isn't making a bunch of money or having an amazing relationship. Success to me is being able to accomplish the things you want. If you want something and you can get it, you have success. And the ability to be able to get anything you set your mind to, the more, the more you could do that, the more successful you really are. 
that's success to me. It's just the ability, you set a goal and you can actually make that your reality, that's success. You talk a lot about confidence. How would you define confidence? Confidence is comfort. The more comfortable you are, the more confident you become, right? Now, a lot of people think confidence is a super state, but the truth is, if I asked anyone to pick this cup up, they probably could, and they'd be pretty confident in doing so. They'd right. be so confident they could bet me $10,000 that they could pick it up, right? And they would pick it up. So, they're, it's because they're comfortable doing it. Now, if you want to become more confident, step into the things that make you uncomfortable. You're not comfortable talking to people? Talk to five people a day. Yeah. You're not comfortable getting a girl's number or a guy's number? Get five numbers a day, or try to. You know, you're not comfortable public speaking? Go public speak. That's how you get more confident, because what's gonna happen is your brain turns on and it says, oh, these things aren't that uncomfortable. All of a sudden, I could do the things I wanna do. And when you become confident, your brain thinks differently. It operates differently. It's much, much faster. Your memory's better. You're more efficient. It's, it's a complete, you know this, right? When you turn your confidence on, all of a sudden you're out of this trance. You become present, you're here. You're not in your head, you're out, you're comfortable. Do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? Oh, 100%. And what does that mean? So it means that they are not able to tap into their potential because they have been programmed into this fallen state. They've been programmed to be limited because the way that they can be controlled is by not believing that they can have the power that they really have. If someone really believes that they can't do the things they want to do and they need to depend on the government, they need to depend on other people, and at the very least they need to go through the system, they need to be sheep. You need to go to college, pay us a bunch of money to then have a bunch of debt, never make any real money in your life, potentially buy a okay house and then retire at 65 to having not really that much money. If you buy into that, you're buying into this yeah. fallen state. You're buying into the ability to never tap into what could have been your potential. There's no such thing as there's only so many rich people in the world. There's, there's enough money to go around for everybody. Yeah, it's just is. you want to make the money. We're in the best country to do it. So do you, are you married? I'm not married. Do you date? I do. You date? Yeah. And do you date a lot? Not anymore. No, I have a girlfriend now. You have a girlfriend? Yeah. And is that boring? No. So it gets, it's boring. It's boring when you don't believe that if you're not fulfilled, a lot of people settle. They'll go into a relationship or a marriage that they don't actually want to be a part of. Right. The person doesn't meet their needs. They're in a fallen state. They think they have to get married. They think they have to have a family. And they just do it. And then they're not even happy with the other person. They, like For example, a lot of the time, religion will program people to just marry someone quickly. right? You know someone for a month, and you're just like, okay. But if you know them at a deep level, which most people don't, then they're like, okay, well, Awesome, let's get married, and then they're just, they're there, right? So are you able to get any girl that you want? Yes. You can get any woman you want? Anyone I want. Amazing. And so what made you settle with one at this point? So I, there are specific qualities I look for in people that stand out to me. The biggest thing I look for is not to have a lot of women. It's to have a connection, <laughs> right? It's to have one connection. People are looking, I, yeah, it's fun. You can have, you know, you can be like a playboy, but at the end of the day, it's not as fulfilling to me as having an actual intimate connection with somebody. And if I can connect with somebody on that level and find someone who meets my values, shares my beliefs, you know, and is supportive of me, I'd rather have that than a thousand women that, that would, you know. And so how do you handle this one girlfriend when she get out of control? You know how women go nuts sometimes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, they're so like mad about nothing. Communication. Now that you have one, they'll be jealous of you. Uh -huh. All these women pull it, you know, so, pulling on you, so, so the thing grabbing is, on you. How would you deal with that? Yeah, so, so most of the time, if a woman's like that, I probably won't even date her. It's a red flag to me. But let's say you know, we're in a relationship and there's something I do that upsets them. I'm amazing at communicating. I'm, I always talk it through. Like, okay, hey, what's bothering you? I tell them what's bothering me. If something bothers me, I say it right away. Hey, I don't like this, don't do this. And if they continue to do it, I just leave. I, don't, I never stay in a relationship longer if it makes me unhappy. If something's unhappy, if I don't like what I do, for, if I wake up tomorrow and I say I hate what I do, I'm, I'm gonna stop doing it. So you woke up tomorrow and you like bother with this girl you're dating now because she's irritable or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Would you just say goodbye? No, so I'll work it out. I'll, I'll, I'll communicate. But if it's not going anywhere when I try to communicate, what, let's say she's not being receptive, she doesn't want to change, she's yeah. just going to continue clashing with me, then I'll walk away. You just say goodbye. Yeah, but it, you know. Would the, you be heartbroken to let that go? Of course. You know. And why would you be heartbroken? And you see that this is not what you want, it's not going to work. Because you could still love somebody, but I'm not going to hold on to that, right? A lot of people will be heartbroken and they're just going to sit in their bed and not do anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to make progress. Yeah. Okay, it didn't work out. Yeah, that's upsetting. But you know what? I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to grow from it. I'm going to find someone who's, you know, who's going to match me. Because in my mind, there's always going to be someone who's going to meet my standards. If I'm with somebody who's not currently meeting my standards right now, even if I thought they were, all it means is now I'm going to get closer to the person who finally will. So does the heartbroken mean that being, becoming heartbroken over this particular girl, does that mean that you were hypnotized by her? 
Yeah, so it, I mean, in a way, you're hypnotized to believe that this person is going to be what you want, right? Oh. So you have this filter of this is what the perfect girl looks like to me. So and then, as a hypnotist, though, can you see that she's hypnotizing me and it's not really real? So now, now I see the difference, right? Before, I, like I said, a girl would sit on me and I'd be like, oh, this is right. the girl I want. Yeah. Now I'm much pickier because it's a lot easier for me to read between the lines. Like, is this actually someone who meets up with my values, someone who actually believes what I believe, who's going to support me in the way I want to be supported, who's going to love me in the way I want to be loved, rather than you know just find someone that looks good or something meets my... Like, for example, you see this cup. I want a cup that looks exactly like this, except let's say the cup was missing everything except the handle. Right. Right. But in my mind, I see the handle and the whole cup. <laughs> <laughs> right, but in reality, it's just a handle. Yeah. I want the full cup. So what what I do now is instead of just seeing the handle for the handle, I look at everything and I see. Okay, does this person actually have all the qualities that I'm looking for? And if they do, then I continue. I don't rush into things right away. Um, so how long have you been dating this particular one? Uh, so I've known this one for three years, but uh, we've we've really recently just kind of kicked it off. Are oh, you starting to see? You know what? Uh-uh. Hmm. Like, uh-uh. It's, so it's the other way around, to be honest. I actually, I, I, I was the other, I would walk into it thinking it's not going to work out. And all my beliefs of oh, like, I see. so I was actually hypnotized the other way. I was like, there's no <laughs> way I'm ever going to find a girl like this. And, you know, I would just walk in waiting to find something wrong. <laughs> and then nothing's wrong. It just is better and better and better. Oh, I see. Are you a Christian? No, I'm Jewish, actually. You're Jewish? Yeah, I'm Jewish. You don't look like a Jew. I know. That's what everyone, even my mom says this to me. I'm thinking maybe you're Arab or something like that. Yeah, no. Or Armenian or something mm -hmm. like that. My parents are both born in Israel, um, and I'm a first-generation American. But, you know, my mom's side is Spain, Morocco. My dad's side is Austria, Hungary. So, wow. Yeah. Do, would another Jew recognize you as a Jew? Only if I uh, put my necklace out. And I speak Hebrew fluently, so I mean, if I speak Hebrew, but for the most part, probably not. That's amazing. Yeah. Isn't that like amazing? I, you don't look like a Jew. I, <laughs> it's funny, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you're around a bunch of people who hate the Jews and they start talking about the Jews Doesn't because they me. don't know that you are a Jew, what would you do? Doesn't bother me. I listen. Uh, it's just their beliefs. They're hypnotized to believe that. Yeah, that is so true. Yeah, and I just listen to it, and I can, I'm a hypnotist. <laughs> I just change it. Is there a difference you know? between men and women? Yes, What's of course. The of course, there's a difference. What's we're, the difference? We're, so Other than body parts. No, 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 yeah, no, no. Be, men and women are wired completely different. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we're a hundred percent different. What women want, what men want, are different. Why are we attracted to women, and why are women attracted to men for the most part? I'm talking about heterosexual men and women, right? right. And that kind of relationship. Right. The real deal. And the fact that we put it under one umbrella is not true. It's not true, right? Right. If you look at man. biologically, if you look at it, right? Why? What do women look for? Their brains are wired, by the way, to look at small things, to be narrowly focused, right? Men are, look, are, are more big picture. Right. So well, the reason is, is because when we're in a tribe and there's a tiger over there, we're not going to be looking at the fucking water boiling and seeing if there's, you know, any dirt inside of the, you know, the water. That's not our job. Our job is to look to see if there's any threat. A woman's job in that tribe is to take care of the kids, take, make sure that nothing's going on with them, take care, make sure that there's no f poison in the food, you know, to cook, gather things, hunt, you know, th th we had different jobs. Like, we, we were hunters, men are hunters yeah. and protectors, and women would have a different job. So they're programmed that way. We're programmed differently. And, and if you talk about relationships, we're also programmed very differently. Yes. Right? And oftentimes, how women act towards men in our current society is exactly what they want men to act. But most women don't know what a strong man is because most men are not strong anymore. That's right. They're hypnotized to be weak. Yeah. They're being weak. Yeah. Right? And we've gone into this very... A feminine, like, like it's bad to be a masculine male. It's bad to be a man. And women just get more and more frustrated because they don't actually want that. At the end of the day, they don't want that. But if they meet a guy who is masculine, they'll, they don't understand it because they're so used to walking all over, all over these weak yeah. men. And they'll try and bring him down. That's why you see what's happening with Donald Trump right now. People hate him. Women, some women hate him. But these women are the ones that hate men. They're the ones who are, they're not, like feminism, I, I support. I believe equality. I think we should be equal, 100%. That's, In what way? So I think men and women should be equal because we both should have the same rights. We should be able to do the same things, right? But I don't think equality means that men, if, for example, if a girl were to accuse a man of rape, immediately his life is, is, is tarnished. Yeah. But if it's a false accusation, what happens to her? Yeah. Right? right. And, they, and then they say, it's, oh, well, that happens because then we don't want to discourage women from, uh, you know, talking about it. But you're also encouraging it, right? We, we, we've gone to this other extreme. Before, we wouldn't believe women. Now we believe women. Right, Every, oh, but, and you should. But statistics, you should look at statistics. And also, I believe in innocent until proven guilty. Right now, yeah, it's guilt. Right. right now, it's accusation. You're guilty. You're guilty. Yeah, and and it ruins your reputation. Even if you prove you're innocent, you're still yeah. never innocent. You're gone. And that's not okay. So let me ask. Um, 
Do you know the difference between an alpha male and a beta male? 100%. And are you a beta? No way. Beta or alpha? 100% alpha. alpha. I, I'm the definition of an alpha male. Would you ever marry a woman who's unwilling to stay home and watch over the kids and, and become a, a housewife? Would you marry a woman that's unwilling to do that once you have kids? Unwilling? No. She has to be willing. I mean, there are going to be times where we could trade off, sometimes where she does her thing and I do mine and we watch the kids. But if she's immediately saying, I'm never going to clean, I'm never going to cook, I'm never going to watch the kids, that to me is just someone who's not going to be a good mother. I, yeah. I want someone who's going to be a good mother, right? right? My mother, my mother took care of me. My mother was literally around me and my sister all the time. She cooked for us. She, she took care of us. She was with us like this. And if a mother really loves her kids, she's going to want to be around her kids. Absolutely. Now, do I think a woman should marry a beta male? No. I don't think a guy should also be, you know, the guy who's just completely there and, and bumming it off, not, not taking care of the kids, not supporting you. You should not marry a guy who's, who's like that either. Don't marry a loser. I think there's, both of them should be committed parents. You want to have a family and you want to have healthy kids, should both be committed to it. You both should be supportive of the kids. Long, long story short, I've noticed that most women mm -hmm. um, turn their, uh, the children away from the father toward the mother, mm -hmm. and they play victim. Uh, they pretend like the father's the mean guy, your father's an alcoholic, your father this and that. It's called neotony. And so they turn the kids toward them, and now the kids have a false sense of sympathy for the mother, mm -hmm. and they hate their father. Is that a form of hypnotism oh, yeah. when the mother's turning the children away from the father? Yeah, I think that's super unhealthy. I think that a healthy dynamic is when the mother and the father have a good relationship because that's what they're going to learn. Right. But uh, this is called, in the culture, we're doing something called neotony. What neotony is, is when an adult animal behaves like an adolescent. So if you look at females, like Disney Channel, right? What, they have big eyes, small noses, big lips. That's what's attractive. Right. You look at a baby, what do they have? Same thing, right? right? And, and you know, the fact that men have to pay for a woman every time they go out <laughs> is also an adolescent behavior. It Who do you is. pay for besides a kid, right? Yeah. So these are, these are adolescent behaviors. And the culture is programming and hypnotizing the entire society to find this attractive. We're finding adolescent behavior attractive. For example, what does a girl do sometimes? She'll like bat her eyes, you know, she'll like make her eyes more almond shaped, bigger, you know, make her nose smaller. That's that's what's considered attractive. Bigger lips. And now they're buying and paying for butts. What do you mean what'd you say? They buy those false butts. And, oh yeah, yeah. I don't they, they have heard that women that men like big butts. Yeah, because the culture is hypnotizing them to think that. Yeah. Right? Like Kim Kardashian, all right. that. Right. Isn't that ridiculous? I, I think that people should be authentic. Yeah, if, if, I know, do too. I, I think that beauty is who you already are. I think if you're confident with who you are, you're more beautiful. But when you need That's to go... That's right. And, and, and most people are believed that they're not, you know, the culture will tell them you're not beautiful. These women are not, they're ugly. You know, yeah. you're not ugly. You are beautiful. Yeah. You know, just own it. But also, I don't like that the culture is promoting things that aren't healthy. For example, these overweight models. Right? Uh, How, no, that's gross. Like, it's not healthy. No, it's totally gross. It, it, I don't want a fat woman. Well, I don't either. But I do not want a fat, well, whether a, she's black woman, or white. Ask a woman if she wants a really fat guy. You ever dated a black girl? I have never had a girlfriend that's black, no. But I've, I've gone out on dates with black girls, yeah. You have? Yeah. Have you? So you've been with a black girl? I've been with a black girl, yeah. Is it hard to go back when you go black? <laughs> I don't know. You know, it, it's, it's funny because I don't. It's not the skin. It's just either attractive to me or not, right? It's not the color of the skin to me. Right. But the culture is different. Not always, but sometimes the call, they're, 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 you know, my belief system is different. So for example, an Asian girl, a white girl, and even Americans, their culture is different than my culture. My culture, because right. I, I grew up Israeli. My parents yeah. are Israeli. So my culture is different than most cultures. You know, and the closest culture I can resemble is, I believe it or not, Muslim culture, like, like Arabs. They're the closest to my culture in, in regards to socializing. But, uh -huh. I mean, they have some extreme beliefs that are different than my, mine. But, uh, um, would you ever have sex out of wedlock? Out of what? Wedlock. W what does that mean? Would you have sex without being married? Yeah. You have sex without being married? Yeah, I don't, I don't care about that. But they hypnotize you when you do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't need the... You know how women are like sex dealers and men are sex addicts? Mm -hmm. And the moment you have sex with them, all of a sudden you start thinking about them, you want to be with them, you feel emotionally if you're beta. attached to them. I, I believe if, if, you, if you come from a beta, from a beta perspective, yes, because then you don't believe you can get more, and then your brain is wired to be hooked on one. Oh, that's now, what it is? Yeah, and in regards to, you know, I, for, for me, marriage is a title, right? I, it's just because I decide to marry somebody or put a ring on their finger, it doesn't change my bond with them. And if it does, then that's just a belief, right? I like to get past all of that. I like to get past anything that limits me from really connecting to somebody. So um, it's, it's like, how can I marry somebody that I haven't necessarily connected to completely, 
right? If I don't know them, I haven't slept with them, I haven't, I haven't been able to understand them at that level, how, how am I going to commit the rest of my life to one person? So can you get to know a woman by sleeping with her before marriage? Yeah, of course. What would you learn from that? Well, it depends, right? Are you just sleeping with her to sleep with her? Yeah. What do you want, right? Like, do you, do you want to potentially have a relationship with her? If, if yes, then, and you're, you're serious with her, then okay. But if you're just sleeping around, I think that's not a healthy behavior. You're going to contract an STD. So let's say that yeah. you, you, you're dating a woman, mm -hmm. and you have sex with her before marriage, right? Mm -hmm. And so the sex is all exciting, and you think, wow, this is my wife. Mm -hmm. I'm going to marry this one. And then you marry her, and the sex is called boring. Mm -hmm. Would you divorce her? 100%. You would divorce her? Yeah, I'm not. It's like it's like <laughs> it's like me. It's like saying, "Hey, bro, come buy this. Uh, we have a Ferrari on sale, and then you come to buy the Ferrari, and then I end up selling you a bicycle." Don't pretend to be something you're not. So you like test driving it before you buy it? Listen, men men are attracted biologically. Men need sex. If there's no sexual chemistry in a relationship, and I don't care what anyone says, if there's no sexual chemistry, a man will not want to be in the relationship. Why do they need it so much? Because biologically, what is, what is our purpose? A man's purpose is to survive and procreate. If a man cannot procreate, he no longer feels like a man. He will no longer be happy. How men receive their validation is through sex. How women receive validation is through connection. That's why women don't like to be used, right? They don't like to just But be... a woman is not really into sex. They're looking for the love of the man and not the sex, but they'll give you sex to draw you in. And once you get in, if they, it, so, they'll use that to control you. So, I, I so think, they're looking for the love, but they'll, they'll I, give you the sex. I think it depends on the, on, on, the, on the dynamic between the two, because I think that a lot of women do love sex. They actually love sex more than men. They feel more than us, right? They, no, imagine, they're pretending. Uh, not always. No, they're, they're like, they're moan and groan. And carry so that's, on if they're fake, that's if it's because inauthentic. Because they know that that makes the man feel like he's a man. So he's I'll tell you, really, most women I've been with, most women I've been with, have never even had an orgasm. Right from another guy. Thank God. Right, they've never had one. And then I'll I'll be with them, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, this is what sex is supposed to be like. And the reason this happens is because if they view the male as a beta male, <laughs> they don't want to mate with him. They don't want to mate with him because they're going to have kids that are not going to be successful. So they're not attracted to them. They're just women. Oftentimes will settle too. They're not going to go for an alpha because it's intimidating. They're taught that they're supposed to be the powerful one in the relationship, and anything out of that makes them uncomfortable. They don't understand it, but biologically they're attracted to it. Do you think that it's natural for a woman to have an orgasm? Yes, 100%. But any woman that's having an orgasm is becoming a man. It's not natural for women to do that. That's why you have to sweat to make them do so it. It's, so the reason women actually have orgasms, the re it, it should not be hard. It should actually be easier to make it. I can, I can give... Like, it's not natural for them to do it. It's unnatural. It depends. Because... So uh, biologically, biologically, the reason a woman has an orgasm is because if she had an orgasm with a male, it means that he's the most attractive, which means he's the alpha, which means she should then, because what happens when she has an orgasm, she then gets a bunch of chemicals, a cocktail of emotion that makes her attached to the male, saying, hey, you might have this guy's offspring, become attached to him, right? But they, they fall in love with you when they have an orgasm because if she had an orgasm with a guy, a real orgasm, right? Like, like through penetration, then all of a sudden, oh, that must be an alpha male. But if they didn't have the orgasm and they're not really enjoying sex, there could be multiple reasons. It could be because of trauma. It could be because they're just not attracted to the guy. Even if the guy's good looking, if the guy's a beta male, he's not attractive to them. That's amazing. That's really amazing what you just said. It's yep. mind blowing. I gotta put my guests on the hot seat, Paul. We gotta heat this up. All right. So I gotta put you on the hot seat. Okay. And I need you to answer these questions quickly as possible. The hot seat. Have you ever hypnotized a woman to uh, to date you? No. Do you believe in Jesus? No. Are you a feminist? No. Should women submit to their husbands? Depends. What, like, what, what context? Should women submit to their husbands? No. Is it morally right to have sex on the first date? Yes. Will Kanye West become the president one day? No. <laughs> Are millennials selfish? Yes. Are you a slut maker? No. Oh, you a slut maker? No. You don't know it. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you a slut maker? Um, is it beta to be a, a, a vegetarian? No. Uh, is blackface racist? Blackface? I don't know. What is that? You know how these white people put on black faces and oh, yeah. as a yeah. cartoon? And yeah. That's racist? Well, like, why would they put on blackface? Because they admire black people in Halloween or they may have an event. Oh, like a Halloween? No, I don't think it's racist. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. 
I, uh, I thought you meant like if they're trying to say something towards the other. So blackface is just like a costume. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I don't know what the reason is behind it, but. Did you have fun? I had a lot of fun. Thank you, man. I Thank appreciate you for having that. Me, Jesse. Yeah. That was amazing. Thank you. Do you have anything that you want to promote or help people find you? Or... Yeah. Um, if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, at Marcel, M A R C Z E L L, um, YouTube, Marcel Klein. It's spelled Mark Zell, but it's pronounced Marcel. Z is silent. Um, you know, if you guys want to come to one of my seminars, I have them all over the world, LA, um, all over the US. LA is March 27th and then in April again. But if you want to just find out more information, follow me on Instagram and, uh, you know, I'm going to post. Do you hold those seminars every month or so? Or yeah, I, have some, I, I speak. I speak on stage every two weeks. Around the country. All over the country. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you all for tuning in. I absolutely appreciate it. That was an amazing conversation. Let me hear from you about it. And don't forget to like, follow, subscribe, share, and sunny. And don't forget to ring the bell. You can ring my bell. We have merch and all that different stuff. Thank you, folks. I'll see you next time. State. You are what they call an inclusive dating coach. Yes, a lot of the dating coaches mainly focus on heterosexual, matrimonial minded dating. But then there's a lot of people, especially in the big city, who are doing things a little different. I'm actually dating somebody who is transgender. You um, are? Yes, female to male. What? Yes. What and the? Are you trying to make me not fist bump you ever again? You know, Kobe passed. I have never seen so many men cry Beta. and show emotions. Beta. Okay, no, I, yeah. <laughs> Do I get a bump on that? No. Thanks for watching The Fallen State. We need your continued support. Donate to my nonprofit here. Subscribe and like the videos here. And tell everybody and their mama about the show.